in church or something. But he said, oh, yes, we have that We have a, uh, that guy here. And I said, oh, I'm just sending somebody down there to pick it up. <laughs> and I went in there, and I acted like I was from that church. He said, yes, I do that. He said, we got you doing that. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm so glad to see all three of you here this morning. This is your first time to be here live this morning. So I'm sorry, but I won't be back until the end of the month. <laughs> this will be your first and your last. Hopefully you'll come back when we, when we get back. And Robert, too. So Tony and Mary, glad you guys are here. Uh, and really, uh, this is where you're going to grow because we're just going through the New Testament so quickly, chapter every time, three times a week. So it's just uh, amazing what God uh, reveals to us as we go through this. Um, sorry, there's a couple of visitors here that are with the group here. So good morning. Uh, Minister Manny, good to have you, brother. Chuck, <laughs> God bless you guys. Hey, uh, we stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but unfortunately, this will be the last uh, time I stream until, uh, let's see, the 28th, because I'm going on a short missions trip. I'll be out of the country, so I won't be streaming. It'd be nice if I could do it from there, but I won't be able to because there's, there's no communication whatsoever. I'm out in the boonies in Africa somewhere. No cell phones? No cell phones, nothing. No, no communication at all. So um, you won't know where I'm at, what I'm doing for a whole two two weeks or so so but if you're in the neighborhood and like to join us after october you're more than welcome to join us at 5383 <coughs> martin street um today we are in the book of hebrews chapter three so grab your bibles a pencil highlighter your cup of coffee and let's let's be blessed by the lord okay. let's pray heavenly father we thank you lord lord for your precious word Oh, Father, what it has been through, Lord, for all these years, just the Old Testament, the Septuagint that has been uh, written by the Jewish people to keep the manuscripts fresh and alive, Lord, and then the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls would just verify the Old Testament scriptures completely, Lord. Everything that is there is there. There are no errors. There are no discrepancies, Father. Uh, whatsoever, Lord, and, and that's pretty amazing when you compare all of these documentations, and they have these documentations uh, in some museums, <clears throat> Bible museums, with so much more documentation, so the evidence is there, <clears throat> and then, of course, Lord, the New Testament, which we have thousands and thousands, I think over 5,000 uh, copies of the New Testament, that's, that's more copies than than Aristotle's uh, history, which is amazing because we'll receive that quickly, but the word of God, not so quickly, though we have so many more copies, and again, no errors, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you have opened up our eyes to understand that the word of God is not a bunch of men getting together and writing down some stories, but Lord, it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, you have opened up our eyes to see that this is a letter in one whole book form, written to mankind from God himself. And we thank you, Lord. And as we continue to study, Lord, may you encourage us today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. So let me just kind of recap here rather quickly. We don't know who the author is of Hebrews. Um, I lean towards it being the Apostle Paul because Paul seems to have most of the credentials of understanding and knowing the Old Testament, being a Pharisee or very religious man. We know Paul was a studier. He's one of these guys that was a bookworm, you know, there's always in a book, you know, you're talking to him, he's probably got a book reading it while you're talking to him. You know, that's how much he just loved reading and gaining knowledge. But he was very clear that all the knowledge that he had, he considered as nothing compared to the knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ personally. And guys, really that's what it comes down to. It's not how smart you are how intellectual you are, you know, what a great philosopher you are, the command of the English language and all of those things. It has nothing to do with your relationship with Jesus Christ. What matters is, do you know Jesus Christ personally? Have you encountered him and do you have a deep, intimate relationship with him? That's what matters. That is what counts above anything else. You can have a PhD in, in, in biblical studies, but not know Jesus Christ mm. and you've lost so it's knowing Jesus Christ. And I tell you, Jesus Christ came for the poor. Jesus Christ came for Amen. those that were humbled in life's, in the society. I came to serve 
and not be served, he said. So this story is about Jesus and Paul, if, it's the, if he is the author, uh, gives us very clearly in the beginning how Christ himself is so important because he came from God himself. In fact, he is God, chapter one. And then he begins to describe to us in chapter two more of Jesus Christ and what he has done as he was made a man a little lower than the angels and so forth. And now he's going to tell us that Christ is even superior to Moses. And that's a big deal for the Jewish people, isn't it? Because Moses was, was very known by the Jewish community along with Abraham. Moses was the deliverer. Children of Israel. Boy, we made a movie called Moses, right? Uh, how he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. And so he was one of the forefathers. He's an example to them. And, and so Paul is making a point to the Jewish people here that he is even superior to Moses. So if you put any weight in Moses' studies and teachings and who he is as a man, you should put more into Jesus Christ because he's far superior to Moses. And so we're going to read a little bit about the story of Moses and Christ and what Christ did. And we're gonna read the failures of Israel as Moses had to deal with those things uh, and the fact that Jesus came to the Jewish people but also to the world. Although they were sinful and rejected Christ, yet he came to them because he loved the world so much that God literally gave his son to die for the sins of the world. So let's go ahead and start. Therefore, now in light of what I just recapped, holy brethren, that is separated, brethren. We are sanctified, set apart for God's work. We're not perfect, not at all. And if you think you're perfect, um, you're deceiving yourselves because you're not. We're all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. But he says you are separated to God. So in other words, God is going to put you through the treadmill, in a sense, or through the grinder to get you to be holy. Uh, he will let you go through things. He'll let you make decisions and then you'll suffer your consequences so that you come back to him and say, look, it's better just to be under your hand instead of my own hand. And so we're separated unto the Lord. So he says, holy brethren, separated brethren, partakers of the heavenly call. And it's a heavenly call that God calls all of us to. And this is important to know that God calls all believers to a heavenly calling. There's not one believer that is not called. He has not called us to be pew sitters. He has called us to be involved. If you're a pew sitter, you might want to think about it because you are liking yourselves to the children of Israel who were just a part of the group that didn't want to go in the promised land, didn't want to partake, didn't want to fellowship, didn't want to get involved. They were just part of it. What happened to them? They wandered and God destroyed them eventually. So there's a heavenly calling. Consider, then he says, consider the apostles, the high priests in our confession, uh, Christ Jesus, that is their confession. Consider them. They're examples to the heavenly calling of uh, the apostles and the high priest. Uh, these are all places that God called us to. Uh, and he has called us to something also. And it's all in Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. So now he's referencing Moses here and how all the high priest was faithful. Uh, the apostles were faithful. And now Moses, who was faithful and appointed to a calling. We saw this the last two Wednesday nights, right? Those of you that have, that have been here, we saw uh, the rebellion of Korah, and then we saw the rebellion of the children of Israel against uh, not just Moses, but also of Aaron, the high priest. Korah said, I'm gonna be like Moses. Moses, who do you think you are? I can do what you do. Um, I can preach, I can teach, you know? I, I have wisdom like you do. Wh who makes you think you're better than us that you can rule us? Well, nothing. The difference is God called me to do this, not you. And that's the difference. It's a high calling. Same with Aaron. The people came up and said, Aaron, who do you think you are? We're priests. We offer up sacrifices. We're in the temple clean. Why can't we do your job? And Aaron's again saying, hey, look, I'm nobody, but God's called me to this heavenly calling. So I'm fulfilling my role and that's it. Fulfill your own role. And so remember that. And so Moses here uh, is, is <clears throat> a faithful servant. Now, I love the fact that it says faithful servant. Uh, the Bible doesn't reveal the unfaithfulness of, of Moses, right? Doesn't reveal his anger. Remember the anger issue that Moses had? Yeah. You know, when God says after the second, he, he struck the rock one time and then later on in time in history, God says, I want you to speak to the rock and he wins and strikes it again. And then he said, you stiff neck, it'd be okay. Here, you want water? <laughs> There's your water. You know, and, water goes, and, and God says, you've misrepresented me, Moses. And because you've misrepresented me, you can't go into the promised land. Wow, that must have hurt. There's always repercussions for our sins, guys, always. 
and God will correct us. Uh, but it says here that Moses was faithful. Uh, why doesn't it bring about the, the, the wrongs that Moses did or his flaws? And I think the reason is, is because we're viewing Moses from the eyes of Jesus Christ, right? <clears throat> we are looking at Moses through the blood, shed blood of Jesus Christ, that God has made him righteous through his blood. So he goes on, for this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Who's this one? Christ. Wow, Tony, that was great. You got it. You got it. That was Christ. That one was counted more worthy than Moses. Inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Wow. Is it the house that has honor or the one who built the house? The one who built the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is who? God. Boy, reference that with Colossians chapter 1. Reference that with uh, John chapter 1. Who built this and created the world? God did. And yet we see in, in Colossians, Jesus created all things. And then we go back to Genesis and it says the Holy Spirit created all things. Isn't that interesting? Sounds like the Trinity to me. Because mm -hmm. here Paul is saying God is the builder of all things. So God is one, per, one God, three individuals, right? Then he says, And Moses indeed was faithful in all his household as servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. And we still speak about them today. In fact, our society earlier on in our, our well, this century, I guess, the early 1900s, uh, Cecil D. DeMille wrote uh, a movie called Moses. <clears throat> That's how religious we were as a country back then. And then they tried to, I don't think they, they tried it again, didn't they write another? Not a Noah, it's a Noah. And boy, they that botched that up bad. so bad. Yeah, they weren't biblical bad. at all. Yeah. At least in the movie Moses, they were trying to be a little bit more biblical. The Passion of Christ was very biblical. Yes. It was very good. There were a couple of Catholicism mm -hmm. things in there that you have to be aware of and know, like the, the, the cloth of his face, that's a Catholic thing and so forth, um, but very biblical, and we've gotten away from that. Um, yeah, but he's still spoken of, right? Moses, everybody knows him, Moses. If you go down the street and you ask people, do you know the Old Testament guy, Moses? They probably say, yeah, that's the guy that has the Ten Commandments, right? Yeah, they probably know that, <clears throat> so even to this day. But then it says, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, that is, we're the church, right? We, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So we're his household if we what? If we hold fast the confidence. If we continually to hold fast. Present tense. It's a continual action and it is our choice, active voice, that we continually hold fast to the confession of our faith. And so it's not a one-time deal, guys. It's an everyday thing that you have to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Uh, there are times when I wake up sometimes and I don't feel like I'm, that, that I'm a Christian, that I'm saved, and that God even loves me. But then I just say, Lord, I, I confess you. You're God. You died on the cross for me. Your blood was shed for me. You gave your life for me. I receive that, and it's not by any of my works. And so by that alone, my heart is yours, Lord, and I'm reminded that I'm a believer. And it's by his work alone, and I'm a part of his household. It's by faith. Therefore, verse 7, as the, Holy Scriptures, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And he's still calling men today. Uh, someone might be listening right now or be listening tomorrow or next week or a year from now, this message or on YouTube as we, we um, have a page, Calvary Chapel Inland, and you can find all these devils on there. And they may be listening to it. And God is calling you today, right now, whatever you're going through, Whatever struggles, whatever pain, you've been trying, you've been working hard, you've been trying to fix it, but you can't, and you won't be able to. The only one that can fix it is Jesus Christ, and what you need to do is humble yourself and surrender yourself to Jesus Christ completely and totally. He is the only way that you can get to heaven and have access to the Holy Spirit and to all the power that is available to you if you surrender your life to Him. Amen. Ephesians says in 2 eight for by grace that is favor of God you've been saved through faith it's through faith that, that you receive the grace of God and that is not even of yourself the faith is not even of yourself at all 
So that is something that God gives you a measure of faith for. So what do you need to do? All you need to do is receive it. And as Justin would say, if Manny were to cook you the best steak of the house, which he just did this past Saturday, if he were to cook you a steak, he would put, put the steak right there on the plate. He'd cut it up for you into little bite-sized pieces. He'd grab a fork and Manny would put it right to your lips and he'd shove it into your mouth. He'd touch your tongue and then he'd expect you to do what? Chew it. chew it. And that's all we need to do is chew it. And that's all God expects from us is to chew it. And he gives us the faith to say, I'm going to chew it. I'm going to receive Jesus into my heart. <clears throat> that's how easy it is. And then begin to pray, Lord, now change me. Help me to surrender to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Now he says, do not harden your hearts as in the, in the rebellion. Now he's going to describe that rebellion that took place in the Old Testament. He says, in the day of trial in the wilderness where the where your fathers tested me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they will, or they always go astray in their what? Heart. It's a matter of the heart. It's not the action. The action is a result of what's in the heart. And, and the writer here is saying, look, those in the Old Testament, their hearts were evil. They were wrong. They were fearful. Uh, they didn't trust. They didn't have faith in God. They didn't believe that he would take care of them. They didn't believe that he'd give them victory over the promised land. And so they wandered for 40 years. <clears throat> and it was all a heart issue. All our issues are the heart. How can a man change his heart? He can't. How can we make our ways good? We can't. It has to be the work of God. But what we can do is, is realize that our hearts are wicked. Realize that we're sinful. Uh, Proverbs, what is it, uh, 28, 17, or 14, somewhere around there, says if a man conceals his sin, he will not prosper. See, we need to reveal our sin and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I struggle in this area, and I need you to change my heart. And then wait for the Holy Spirit to change our hearts. And they have not known my ways. Now, that is interesting because he's giving us insight to those Old Testament uh, Israelites. They didn't know God's ways. That's why they wandered. See, children who know God's ways have faith. They have trust because they know him. Oh, they might struggle and the flesh and the weakness of that flesh and the emotions that are there might flare up. And Paul said it, you know, the things that I know I should not be doing, I find myself doing. That means his flesh. Now, he's in an emotional state there, right? Because he's like noticing that he's not being obedient to God, that he's not walking in his ways, and he's doing the opposite there. And then he even goes to the point and says, Oh, wretched, wretched, wretched flesh that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of corruption and death and evil and wickedness? And then he points to Jesus Christ, chapter 1 of Romans 8. You know, that it's Christ Jesus, for there is no condemnation who are in Christ Jesus. That's it. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So we have a flesh, the emotions, the feelings that we need to crucify. We need to push away, we need to murder, we need to do whatever we do to distance ourselves. And, and if these children of Israel would have said, that's our flesh, that's our fear, we're not going to give into it, we're going to walk into the promised land. And we're going to take it. And we're going to trust that God's going to give it to us. That's how a Christian walks, in spite of how he feels. Uh, read Paul's uh, testimony in Corinthians, chapter, or 2 Corinthians, where he talks about being perplexed and, and pressed in and, and destroyed and all of these things. That's not an easy life. Not an easy life at all. And yet he never lost hope. He still believed in God, though he was there. He even said, even if I'm hopeless, but yet absent from the body is present with the Lord. And we know that as children. So the, way, the reason that we fall away, the reason that we turn around, the reason that we're not effective is because we really don't know his ways. Isn't that what First John says? Um, if you say that you love me and yet you hate your brother, you're lying. Yeah. Because there's no evidence of you being obedient to what I've commanded. So you're lying. You don't know me. You don't love me because you hate your brother. So that's evidence of that. And so the heart reveals what's really there. And he goes on and says, verse 11, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Wow. <clears throat> now that's wrath or gay. That's the wrath of God coming upon mankind because of their hearts being hardened to God's ways. And so he cast them out. They were not a part of him. 
So he now gives us a warning to all of us. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Unbelief. Unbelief. <clears throat> That's the sin that God cannot forgive. Uh, he cannot forgive an unbelieving heart. And that's the heart that God's looking for. And that's, uh, our hearts should be hearts of believing and trusting and having faith in God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Least any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So there he goes. Second time that he says this, right? We've got to hold fast, as hard as it is, as hard as the enemy attacks, as hard as people attack, you've got to hold fast to your faith, mm -hmm. continually. And that's a reality in life. And it's, in the Greek, it's the active voice where you have to make the choice to hold on. And yet it's God through the Holy Spirit giving you that strength to hold on to. <clears throat> Verse 15, while it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So again, please do not harden your hearts to Jesus Christ. He has only good things. Now, let's say that, let's say, let's just assume for a second that there are those that say, well, Jesus isn't the way. And there are those who say, yes, he is the way to heaven and the only way. Well, let's assume that those that say that he isn't the way, let's assume that they are right. Okay, maybe Christ isn't the way, there's no way, there's no heaven. We just all die and go in the ground. Let's just assume that that's the truth. If you give your life to Jesus Christ and you live by his moral standards, and there are people who teach that. Jesus was a good moral teacher. He had some great principles. And if we live by that, we would probably have a very comfortable life, a prosperous life, a healthy life. And then we die and just go into the ground, like atheists say or, or people say who that Jesus isn't. So, hey, what do we got to lose? Nothing. Nothing. And receive Christ and have a good life, good teaching. Or, now let's assume that maybe Christ is the way to heaven. And if you don't believe that, what do you have to lose? Everything. 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 Because if you don't believe that he's the way to heaven, then you're not going to the ground, you're going to hell. You'll be separated from God for eternity. So really... The only choice that we have is to receive Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and it is by faith, but I think it's by faith that, that's based upon logic and, and many factors that we find in the scriptures. Uh, from historical facts, I mean, we have so many historical references of Jesus Christ. We have so many documents, as I said. You know, we have writings from some of the, what, uh, I'm forgetting the Plato and artists, uh, Josephus. Josephus. Um, Caesar's writings, which we only have like less than 100 copies or 50 copies, something like that. And yet we take that information as those historical. And yet we have thousands, five, over 5,000 copies of the New Testament. They found these, um, they found these little, uh, Josh McDowell found these little um, statues, or, or they, they were paper mache statues, little, little Egyptian figures. And he bought a bunch of them. And then he thought, I wonder what's underneath them. I mean, they're made out of paper mache. You know how you make paper mache, right? You just yeah. wet it with something. You keep... And he thought, well, let's undo one. So they did. Do you know what they were paper mache's of? The New Testament. Oh, wow. The New Testament. All of them. <clears throat> and so he said, in Egypt, the New Testament was so readily available that they used it for paper mache's. That's how much of it was going around. That's historical evidence to the New Testament existing at that time. It's just amazing what, what we have historically. And so that's evidence for us that we don't just believe in something that we have to just trust by faith, but it's got some factual uh, truth to it, you know? Um, <clears throat> history. You can look at this, the scriptures, kind of uh, what they call textual criticism, how it's written, uh, how it's, seems to flow. Like if you were to throw in the book of Enoch, you would find some things that relate to the New Testament or Old Testament, but then all of a sudden you would come up to this section where it just was weird. <laughs> like what was this person even thinking? Like an elephant had a relationship with this animal and thus came forth deers and dogs and other, and it's like so weird that you know like this is way out there. So 
if the New Testament was that available, you could see how men would take some of that truth, write it down, and then add their own little bit to it and say, oh, here's the book of, Ju- uh, of uh, Enoch, you know, that I found. You know, give me some money. You know, that kind of thing. And, and you see that with the Apocryphas also. Uh, stuff that's um, so out of there. Uh, even the um, Islam, their Quran, oh, so way out of there when you read their book. It's like ridiculous. Um, flying donkeys and, and all these kind of things that are just so out there. Right? Now you might say, but the Bible has a talking donkey. Yes, it does have a talking donkey, but it's, it, it's in a context where, where God is specifically doing something. It's not so outlandish out there that, you know, it's just strange. So we have a sure word, and we should believe that word very clearly as he's giving us the, 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 the word here. So we must believe that word and not have a rebellious heart towards it. Let's close up verse 16 through 19. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And and that's who rebelled, right? All those who came out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Now, with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Because he judged them for 40 years and they all died. And a new generation was raised up. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. Unbelief, unbelief guys. So it's unbelief. Turn to Luke real quick. I just want to show you something. <clears throat> Luke chapter 8. Verse 11. This is a parable that Jesus gave. He said the seed is the word of God. You, you remember the seed that uh, was, uh, the, uh, went out the sower, went out to sow the seed and sowed some, fa- and it fell by the wayside. He said, uh, those that fell by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They're not saved. They hear the word, then they go away. The devil ri- rips them off and they're not saved. But the ones on the rock, are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and and these have no root, though. And and the word is, is it's not that it's no root, it's it's not, it's um, no foundation at all. It's not even clinging. It's just a plant in the ground. And it says, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. So they fall away, and they're not saved, because of temptation. Now, the duration of time here, it, it's unlimited. So it's not immediate. It could be a year from now, two years from now, 10 years from now, to fall, to fall away, yeah. or 50 years from now. Mm. And we've seen that. Billy Graham used to have an assistant pastor, served him for a long time, and then all of a sudden he wrote a book, There Is No God. Wow. You know? So something happened there. And from what they understood, that he had a lot of questions that he should have asked earlier on in his life. Some basic, simple questions about the Bible and who God is and so forth. So it's interesting that there's no duration of time. Then it says, the one that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. So um, they may be saved, but there's really no fruit there. And there's no maturity in their life. But the one who fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble heart and a good heart, keep it and bear fruit and with patience. See, they keep it. That's the difference. And James said the same thing. Be doers of the word, not just hearers only. Otherwise, you deceive yourself. So there has to be fruit. You have to be obedient to God's word. You, you are justified by Christ alone. And then the sanctification process begins where now you are walking in obedience to God and God is helping you to walk in obedience. You fall, you stumble, but you get back up and continue to walk in obedience. And when we are faithful to continue and endure through that process, then comes glorification. When we're in heaven and it's all over and we live for eternity. So this will be over soon, guys. Maybe sooner than we know. Amen. But it will be over and we will be in heaven. As Paul says, absent from the body is present Present with with the Lord. Lord. And all our troubles and cares will be done away with. 
Oh, I can't wait for that day, Lord. Come today, right now, yes. Lord. you got 10 seconds. Let's go. Let's pray. Father, would you come back now, Lord? Maybe you're waiting for us to pray and be in agreement here, Lord. Lord, begin the end, Lord, we pray, as, as Paul said in Thessalonians, that the end has already begun. And we're at the, the last days, Father, and we see that. Lord, I pray your word went out, and I pray those that are listening, Lord, with unbelieving hearts, that they would turn from their ways and turn to Jesus and receive him as their Lord and Savior by simply saying, Jesus, come into my heart. I agree, I'm a sinner. I, I have messed up. And I continue to mess up, and I just have no control of my life whatsoever. It's out of control. I believe the lies. I need you, Jesus. Come into my heart and be my Savior. I receive you, and now fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Worship the Lord. And we will see you the twenty. 5th, 6th, 28th, which is a Monday of October. Have a wonderful day. God bless you.